Welcome to the Nursing Post podcast, all nursing all the time with Ashley Moore and Rosa Horsley. Today we talk about muscular dystrophy. Our goal is to always inform and start conversation. There are several different types of muscular dystrophy. With that being said, today we're going to cover the two most diagnosed, which are Duchenne and Becker. As they are studied and researched together, muscular dystrophy is a group of diseases causing progressive weakness and loss of muscle mass. Abnormal gene mutations interfere with the production of proteins needed to form healthy muscles. In 1986, the MDA-supported researchers identified a particular gene on the X chromosome. When this chromosome is mutated, it leads to muscular dystrophy. In 1987, the protein associated with this gene was identified and named dystrophin. Lack of this protein in muscle cells caused them to be fragile and damaged easily. It is an X-linked recessive inheritance pattern and is passed on by the mother, who is also referred to as the carrier. Most carriers of muscular dystrophy do not have signs and symptoms of the disease, but there are a small minority that do. According to the CDC, the average age at diagnosis for muscular dystrophy is five years, so five years old. Mm -hmm. The prevalence among non-Hispanic Blacks was lower than the prevalence among Hispanics and non-Hispanic Whites. On average, Black or Hispanic children were tested for muscular dystrophy at later ages than white children. And as we've done previous episodes before, Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised, unfortunately, by that fact. On average, Black or Hispanic children had creatine kinase testing about one year later and DNA testing about two years later than that of white children. About 14 in 100,000 males age 5 to 24 are affected. Males are more likely to be affected than females. So this is statistics that kind of go along with most statistics in America in regards to there being a delay of care in people of color. Absolutely. The disparities are there in health care. And these are statistics from the CDC specifically. So the types of muscular dystrophy that we were talking about, uh, Becker and Duchenne, they both have the same symptoms and they are caused by the same gene mutation. Duchenne has an onset in early childhood, usually around ages two to three. It does primarily affect boys. Of course, there are rare cases where it affects girls. For Becker, there are less severe symptoms that typically start later in life. So some signs and symptoms of muscular dystrophy, we're going to break them down into the two types. Duchenne, which begins as early as ages two and three, and is first uh, noticed by the affected proximal muscles. That's including your upper and lower parts of your body that show weakness first. Other signs and symptoms include enlargement of the calves, waddling gait, and lumbar lidosis, which is an inward curve of the spine. You might notice frequent falls. You might have difficulty rising from a laying or sitting position, trouble running and jumping. Uh, You might notice that these children walk on their toes They have muscle pain and stiffness, may have learning disabilities, and delayed growth. The Becker form of muscular dystrophy is similar to that of the one we've discussed, but they tend to be milder and progress more slowly. Symptoms generally begin in the teens, but might not occur until the mid-20s or later. Symptoms can affect the heart, lungs, throat, stomach, intestines, and spines, or other parts of the body. Progressive weakness and scoliosis result in impaired pulmonary function, which can eventually cause acute respiratory failure. This is why checkups are so important and why you'll see doctors have children or watch children walk when they go for their checkups. Absolutely. Because they're looking for these things. And so a lot of people 
think that it's all about vaccines. And now, which Rose and I are both believers that you should vaccinate. I am a vaxxer. Even if you're not somebody who vaccinates, it's still important to keep follow-up visits because there's other things that are going being looked over and being tested for that Observed. you don't even see, uh, yes. that you don't even know about. It's important to know that follow-ups are important, whether it's with a primary care, if you choose not to go to a pediatrician for your mm -hmm. child, that they're seeing a doctor regularly because they are going to be screening for these things. Well, they're called wellness visits. Right. I, I don't even think they call them annual visits for children. They literally call them wellness visit, visits for a, like a reason and a purpose. Right. I just think that so many people associate it with vaccination, vaccines. Yeah. Vaccination. And, and it's not, that's one part of the visit. Well, I'm not trying to be funny, but every year that you go, your children don't get vaccinated every single year that you go. Very valid point. Just saying. So for diagnosis and treatment, diagnosis is based off of enzyme testing, genetic testing, muscle biopsy, electrocardiograph or echocardiograph, lung monitoring test, and electomyography. So there's a bunch of different testing of different areas. And if you think about it, it all goes back to muscles. Absolutely. So your heart's a muscle. Your um, lungs are a muscle. Your lungs are a muscle. So all those things that used to get diagnosed. And then a lot of it is continued to be used for progression purposes. Absolutely. You're going to be having your regular checkups because the point is to slow the progression. Right. There is no cure. No. So the point here is to slow the progression mm -hmm. of the disease. Right. And so it's not all, okay, I'll go get an echocardiogram done once and I'm done. Well, no, that'll be continued to, to use to, for monitoring. So for diagnosis, monitoring, treatment, evaluation, those are going to be done throughout your entire life mm -hmm. if you have muscular dystrophy. Like Rosa said, there is no cure for muscular dystrophy, but there are medications that we can use to help with symptoms and help from progression. One of the things that we use uh, is corticosteroids. Prednisone is a big one. There is another one, Enfalza. I'm probably mispronouncing that. It is used to help strengthen muscles and delay the progression of certain types of muscular dystrophy. Prolonged use of any kind of corticosteroids does come with risk. Uh, weight gain, weak bones, um, which can increase risk for fractures, risk for infections. There's many different Absolutely. Um, downsides to being on chronic steroids. So that's a, a huge conversation that your provider will have with you before you're just put on those long term. There are newer drugs out there, including one called, and I'm probably mispronouncing this as well, Exondus 51. And you know what? This gets me every time, and I know I say it every time. Like, that's the brand name. Yes. The generic is not much different. So, like, they always do this. They always make these, these drugs so hard to pronounce. So, that medication is approved by the FDA to treat people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it was approved in 2016. In 2019, the FDA approved, here we go again, Vidondus 53. For the treatment of people that also have Duchenne dystrophy, that is specific for a genetic mutation, which is why it's important to have the genetic testing done as Absolutely. quickly as possible. Like we were saying earlier, it is delayed, unfortunately, in Black and Hispanics by two years. Uh, some heart medications like ACE inhibitors or beta blockers can um, be used to help with the heart the heart function because of course the heart is a muscle and a muscular dystrophy affects the muscles there are some therapies yes uh, range of motion and stretching exercises remember that this disease process is all about the muscle mm -hmm. and it's dystrophy that's why it's called muscular dystrophy so it can restrict the flexibility and the mobility of joints limbs often draw inward and become and stay in a fixed position so range of motion exercises can help to keep those joints as flexible as possible of course exercise is never a bad thing all of us should be doing more of it including myself 
So low impact aerobic exercise like walking, swimming, they can help maintain strength and mobility in and general health. Yes. So some types of strengthening exercises might also be helpful. And it's important to talk to your doctor first because some types of exercise for those with muscular dystrophy might actually be harmful. So you just want to make sure you run that through with your with your doc. You know, some therapies are brace, braces. Um, braces can help keep muscles and tendons stretched and flexible, slowing the progression of contractures. Um, braces can also aid mobility and function by providing support for weakened muscles. You also have mobility aids such as canes, walkers, wheelchairs that can help maintain mobility and independence. And of course, breathing assistance. As the respiratory muscles weaken, you may need a sleep apnea device to help improve oxygen delivery while you're asleep. And some people with severe muscular dystrophy may need a machine that forces air in and out of their lungs, such as a ventilator. Surgery might be needed to correct contractures or any spinal curvature that could eventually make breathing more difficult and heart function may be improved with a pacemaker or other cardiac devices. So eventually what happens is slowly you start needing devices to assist you with basic functions. Yes, with your regular ADLs. And that kind of, unfortunately, and it's a progressive disease, so it'll slowly happen, but we've seen patients that are mm -hmm. on ventilators helping them breathe, peg tubes to keep food and fluids and Absolutely. liquids and medicines down. They're incontinent of their bowel and bladder, so some people get catheters, some people just have to be cleaned and changed. And then it just is a progressive thing. And if you're on a ventilator, then you have to have a trach. And yes. so there, there's a lot of care that is involved with people that have muscular dystrophy. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't know a lot about muscular dystrophy, at this point, it is time to be humble as a nurse because their caretaker knows more than you do. Absolutely. You know, the people that are with them every day, the patient themselves, the caretaker themselves, you may think they're giving you some off the wall type of information, but that's necessarily not the case. No. They know that patient's norms, that patient knows their norms, so mm -hmm. they know when something's not right. Right. And I'm a firm believer, you know, in order to be like a good nurse, you also have to be a good listener. That's very true, but I just know that some of the people that I have specifically helped take care of, their family members were vital in making sure that everything happened and keeping that person alive, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. Because without them they would they wouldn't be alive because they have to depend they have on, to depend on them yeah. at, at a certain point at, as this disease progresses, progresses. Mm -hmm. and so it is important that you keep your follow-ups and I think people that have this kind of disease process understand the importance of that and a good support system yes absolutely so I just wanted to tap that in there because we go into nursing considerations and mm -hmm. I think that's a huge one to have absolutely so another thing is you, as nurses, we want to make sure that we are preventing respiratory infections. So maybe getting the pneumonia vaccine, getting the flu vaccine, those things may not 100% prevent flu or pneumonia, but it'll help prevent them from dying of flu or pneumonia. Well, remember their lungs are a muscle and they're already compromised. Right. So what we're, what are we trying to do once again? We're trying to prevent. Right. Which is a great segue into my next one, which is to prevent them from getting infection by avoiding children or other adults that are sick, which that seems pretty basic, but I mean, well, how what? many times... Do, does somebody come to your house and they bring their kid and their kid is sick? I'm not trying to be funny, but kids, they're cootie filled. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And they they're have like germapaloozas. Okay? I can be around adults that are sick all day long. I'm fine. You bring me a kid with a cold. I'm like, it's take over. it down. And it usually, no joke. It usually starts when the children go back to school. Oh um, yeah. You know, they're out for that summer break and then they go back and then they go to school, they come home mm -hmm. fine, and then you're the one that ends up with all the crud. So you have to remember that kids, like all people, carry germs. Yes. But this demographic of patients are already on steroids, so they're already, you know, Prone compromised. To yep. Yeah, so just... 
Yeah, connecting dots there. Absolutely. And then like Rosa was saying earlier, we want to make sure that we're continuing to help with the range of motion. That's not just PT. That's something that nurses can do as well. And breathing treatments, you know, if they need to be on nebulizers, PAP devices, whether that CPAP, BiPAP, you know, non-invasive ventilators mm -hmm. up to ventilators, it's, they're probably going to slowly work their way from a CPAP slowly At up the chain point. up to the ventilator Absolutely. if they so choose that they use while sleeping usually at first and then that tends to progress to something that they'll need all the, all time. the time and so I think that that's just important that we as nurses like Rosa said make sure that we're listening well to our patients and to the family members because that's going to go a long way in patients who have muscular dystrophy Absolutely. As always, we'll link our references to our website, www.thenursingpostpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform and you can leave your thoughts and comments. Thanks for listening to The Nursing Post.